If you are able and uh, got that device, Bible, whatever you've got in front of you with the scriptures on it, um, open it up to the text of Ephesians in chapter 1. We're going to be reading through just the first three verses of Ephesians 1 this uh, morning in just a moment. And so you can go ahead and open that up. Give you a second to get it all squared away, and then I'll start talking about a few things. Ephesians chapter 1 is full of language that connects to the physical attributes of wealth, aspects of richness and value make an appearance here. And that's going to be insightful when we pay attention to the message that God has Paul bring the brethren in Ephesus for a couple of reasons. But before we do that, I want you to back up for a second and think about what it means to be part of a family. And there's aspects of it that are weird and challenging. Um, we were down uh, helping our daughter and son get settled into college this uh, um, past week. And um, there's something that most of you probably are aware with my family and me in particular. I'm very social and outgoing and easily distracted by groups of people I can go meet and interact with. And there's blessings to that. There's also challenges. Um, there's some negatives to that. And that's just kind of me being me. That's how it is. And we kind of accept that. And there's two stories to that that are valuable for us right now. Number one is I was tasked with a job when we got on campus by the family that I needed to make my way from the dormitories over to the administration building and drop off a wonderful gift to the college, a scholarship that Hallie had earned to pay for her education. And so I have the check in hand. It's made out to the school from Chick-fil-A and I'm walking it's probably like a thousand yards from the dormitory to the administration building. And so that's not far, right? A thousand yards to go from here to there. Shouldn't take me more than 20 minutes tops, even if I'm slacking. And I was slacking a little bit. And I walk over there. It took me like an hour and a half to go from there to the building. You say, why is that? Why did it take you that long? Well, between there and the building, I met innumerable number of people that I had gone to school with whose kids just happened to be about the same age as my kids and they're going to school now too and so hey how you doing hey how you doing hey how you doing it's like a network of danger for someone like me or you're entrapped by that get up to the administration building I have one office to go to I got pulled into five other offices before I got there I made it back to the dormitory and my family looked at me and said you're not leaving this room ever again um, you cannot go outside anymore. You can't even make your presence known because you don't know how to say I've got something important to do. And so for the most part, I was caged up for the remainder of our day and a half involved in this organization process. Although I did escape once and I saw Michael Holland, whose daughter is uh, ensconced across the hall from Hallie in her dorm room. And I was able to say to Michael, hey, I can't talk to you. I was told I can't and made it out and made it back, but that's probably because I'll know I'll see Michael in a couple of days anyway. And so there wasn't this, hey, familiar attraction. See, that's me being there, and everyone who knows me knows that's probably the case, and my whole family accepts that. And it's a weird fact about me and this family. But now I have kids who unfortunately look just like me. They should look more like their mother, but they unfortunately look just like me. And so all of them have had to bear the consequence of coming into a place and saying, you're Philip Martin's child, aren't you? Constantly, that occurs in different levels. And you can talk to James, he's had it. Jesse gets it the most, I think, just because he has the same age that I was when we were in college together with that crowd, and he gets on campus and everyone goes, oh yeah, we know who you are. Not even a last name necessary, it's just, boom, you look like your dad, you must be your dad in younger form. This is not the case. Jesse's different than I am. Different personality, different experiences, different expectations. He's got his own wonderful personality, but they don't know him yet. So immediately they look at him and they think, hmm, that's like Philip 2.0. He looks just that way. That's an aspect of family, and all of us have that, and you can kind of see that, and you can see this, the resemblance in a family structure and a family unit, that there are idiosyncrasies that have them behaving sometimes the same, the same mannerisms, the same vocal tones, all of that stuff is true. 
That's a weird fact about families, but think about all of that in this. Because no matter what your family heritage was, maybe you were known for being always late or on time or perfectionist or athletic or academically successful or wealthy. All of those things may actually, on the earthly level, create pain and difficulty. But what Paul is telling us that in Christ, when we are adopted into the family of God, The relationships that we gain and our identity as part of the family of God isn't a negative at all. In fact, it is an absolute positive that we are now incorporated into a body of Christ that has all these weird edges to it. And yet together, it's a blessing. It's wonderful to be identified as part of the family of God. In fact, it's necessary that we find satisfaction in that communal relationship of servants who are part of one another. And I want you to think about this bit of history. You may have heard this small little anecdote before, read it somewhere. It's relatively well known, but I think it's in some ways very poignant for us. There's an individual who passed away in 1916. At that time, she was known as America's greatest miser. She passed away with an estate valued at the time of about $100 million. Hetty Green ate cold oatmeal every day because it cost money to heat it. Her son had a leg amputation because she delayed so long in looking for a free clinic that his case became incurable. She was wealthy by everybody's standard and chose to live as if she had nothing. Eccentric? Absolutely. A thousand percent correct that she was eccentric. Crazy? Perhaps. Although she was never clinically diagnosed as being dealing with some of the mental turmoil that can exist from bad chemicals and bad physicality in your brain. But she was really foolish. She hastened on not only calamity for her child, but her herself, because she actually died bringing on a, the equivalent of a seizure because she was arguing with someone about the value of drinking skimmed milk. I want to tell you that what is seen so obviously in that foolish behavior is actually describing potentially both me and y'all. So wait a minute. And number one, I don't have a hundred million dollars. So let's just get that off the table. But number two, that's not the context here. Because in actuality, I have a wealth beyond a hundred million dollars, and so do you. You and I, we have limitless wealth at our disposals, and yet we choose to live as if we have nothing. That's the attitude that Paul is bringing to the fore of our conversation when he writes to the disciples, because whether they understood it or not, they were made for much more than they thought they were. They were made in such a way to have the kind of true, genuine grace that God offered that could be found through their faith in ways they hadn't even conceived yet. And they lived in a world that told them that they were any number of things, just like you and I. But God in Christ was telling them, you are the adopted son of a king, a creator, a sustainer, and the most majestic kingdom of all. You should live like it. Pay attention now. This is just verses 1 and one through 3 this morning. And we're going to break them down in a second. But just those three verses read this way. This is from the ESV. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to... The saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.1. Grace to you 
and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1-2. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1-3. Paul writes to the brethren at Ephesus and says, if you want the too long, don't read version of the, of the sermon, y'all are living like Hetty Green. You have millions and you won't spend it. Now we get to do the whole Harvey, Paul Harvey thing and get to the rest of the story. In that verse, the first half of, of chapter 1, verse 1 it's the introduction to the text, and it's Paul, an apostle, a messenger of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. In that opening, there are very few names in the Bible, and Paul's one of them, that we immediately connect with and create this structure around them. In our Bible class re recently, we've been re reading through 1 Chronicles, the work of the chronicler, um, or chronicles, if you want the, the short, easy version to say. And the first nine chapters are, in essence, another genealogy, and it's full of people we can't connect to, we don't connect to, even though they're our family in Christ. They are united, just we're grafted into Israel, and they are our family and our history and our heritage. But we don't connect to them because we don't know them. And yet, in Saul, who was Paul, we hear of him and go, I know that guy. I know who he is. Remember, though, we now identify with him. He is our forebearer. How he is known is in part how we are known. And again, ask that question, are you living up to that? And further, when Paul would write and say, follow me as I follow Christ, he is admitting that he's willing to live up to the family heritage of Jesus. And so as we get towed along in the story, we too are towed to the foot of the cross and asking the question, I know Paul, who serves Jesus, do I belong here? Do I live like this is my family? Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul, is the apostle to the Gentiles, Acts 9.15 and he is serving the community of disciples in the first century. And his primary effort is to bring the gospel out of Israel to the nations around. And Paul is probably, at this point, it's around AD 53, engaging with what would become the disciples at Ephesus, the church at Ephesus. In that conflict context, you probably remember uh, Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 20, um, the name Diana, and in particular, the goddess Diana. Diana was known in correlation and contrast to Christians as being someone connected with wealth and power and money, gold and silver. And what Paul had was none of those things. And yet he writes to those people and says, you have something far more precious, something far more valuable. Paul also writes much of this as being a prisoner in Rome when he writes back to these brethren in the letters of Ephesians and also in Philippians. Furthermore, remember this, that this is also tied together with Onesimus, the slave that's mentioned in Philemon in all of this context. This is part of the community of these disciples. Because in those letters... These are the letters that get tied together and sent and brought to the Ephesians, the Colossians, and then Philemon. They're all connected by the threads that make a community a family of eccentric parts, a whole family of God. Slaves, prisoners, landowners, all united in Christ and told all their physicality isn't where it's at. And where it's at is in the wealth of spiritual blessings that are granted to them from God. That letter then is written later in the period of Paul's life, maybe AD 62 or so, and he's on trial for his life. So the apostle, one sent by God with a commission, a purpose, writes to the brethren at Philippi. And you'll notice 
the verse will continue for us here um, in verse 2 and or 1 and following and read this way. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Pause for a moment and think about this. Is it surprising to you that Paul addresses his letters to the word saints, to people we would call saints? Think about how you use that. There's probably at least three common uses we use that terminology in our own speech. We might say, that person was a saint. I think that's a fairly colloquial, common phrase. And when we say that, we mean they were kind, they were helpful, they were super nice. We also sometimes use it very distantly. And we're careful with it and we say, well, yeah, we're all saints. But we don't want to say that we're saints like she was a saint. Maybe some humility, but I also think it's not just that. I think we're afraid of committing to the idea of being a saint. Because if we commit to being something, then like my friend Ben would say, we actually have to be about it and be a saint. You know, pause for a moment to think about what, what that would mean for you if you were to live in the way you think about someone who was, past tense, a saint. Oh, that's a lot of work, right? Sounds challenging. In the biblical context, in the structure of the Bible, the way this is used is to describe something we're actually far more comfortable with saying, I'm a Christian. Do you realize that as they're used, in essence, they're the same thing? But see, we've brought one down and we've pushed one up and made them into two separate things as if the Christian could never be the saint because the saint's like a better version of a Christian. When in reality, they're the same thing. And both of them are equally successful and broken in various ways. And the saints at Ephesus are, again, our heady greens who have tons of money but aren't spending it. They have tons of wealth, but they're not sharing it. They have tons of potential, but they're not living towards it. Nine times in Ephesians alone, those who are receiving Paul's letter identify as saints. And they're alive, but perhaps a little dead on the inside. Pause for a moment and reflect for yourself. If then I see myself as a saint and I kind of internalize that idea as being equivalent to being in Christ, the disciple of Jesus, and all that that is word is meant and means, note this, that being a saint is yoked together in literary tenses with the big sense of the scriptures and in practicality with how you even see it with the idea of grace. Because someone who... Oh, she was such a saint, usually means that they were incredibly graceful to people who surrounded them. Oh, and to tie it into the Bible, think of Acts chapter 4, which we read of just recently in our Bible study this morning, that they took what they had and sold and shared with whomever had a need. They took care of one another. So in a practical way, for at least our purposes right now, it's someone, the saint, who is graceful, with what they've been entrusted with to share with others. They're willing to give of themselves to the strength of others. See, grace and mercy are often found then hand in hand in the scriptures. And this literally leads us to really the force of the text. The force of this passage, this segment of the scriptures, comes to its fullness here uh, in verse 3, where again it reads, Blessed be... The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Very often I will quote purposefully, and you might say as well intentionally, the statement of Jesus regarding where our treasures should reside. In the great, great preaching of, of Christ, he would say, store up treasures in heaven. And he gives on and gives an explanation. He says, you store them up there 
using very earthly terminology, because there's no rust, there's no critters, moss, who will chew it up and eat it up. It'll retain its value. Picture for you a moment, uh, this is probably something some of the gentlemen can connect to. Imagine if you will, and I'm going to use my choices here for this picture, but you can insert your own. Someone gives you a call and say, hey, we're tearing down this barn on my buddy's property. It's an older barn, but um, I think there's something you might be interested in in the car, or in, the, in, the, in there, because there's a car in there. And you go down there, and you start looking around the barn, and you're pulling off some of the wood. And it's an old tobacco barn, and it got some smell to it, so you can kind of smell those air, ages of tobacco in there. You pull the planks off the side, and you see what looks like just the beginning of a tire underneath the tarp. And you're getting a little interested because that tire seems a little wider than an old car might normally have. And you kind of push off the cover of the tarp and six, you know, six different implements from the farm. A bunch of different uh, balers and, and bush hogs are sitting on top of it. You pull those off. And then there's this little thing that says Shelby. And your heart goes, ah. Ah. And if my father-in-law was here, I'd say a 1970 Shelby, but I'm not because I'm going to say a 1967 Shelby fastback because I'm here. And you open it up and you pull all that off. And not only is it in relatively good condition, the key is there and you hop into it, you sit down, you slide into that seat. And it's sitting there in ignition. And like, I wonder, you pull your car up, put the jumpers on it. And this doesn't work out, by the way. But let's just say it did this time. And you crank it over and it sputtered. That actually doesn't happen. The car's battery's dead and it's probably fluids. And it's a bad choice. But this time, it's true. And it starts up. In my case, all of a sudden, I'm young again. Except now I'm young and fast. Because my Mustang was a 68 square back, and it was not that fast. But in my mind, it was just as fast as a 67 fastback. You see, the aim of the author, as he writes to the assembly, Paul, who writes to the church at Ephesus, who have inherited spiritual blessings beyond compare, is to see that gift as if inside the dilapidated, broken-down barn on a farm somewhere, as the world sees it, is a fine and precious gem that no longer should be hidden and pushed away. Every text of God's Word has a special core message to it. And Paul's message to the brethren at Ephesus is to really grasp the riches that can be found in Christ because the source of the blessing is eternal, otherworldly, Beyond us, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through and in Christ, you share in the riches of God's great grace, God's great glory, God's great mercy. And as Paul also would write in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, the unsearchable riches which belong to Christ. So every time you hear someone say to you, hey, we need to store up treasures in heaven, what you're seeing here in this message and in Ephesians is like a laundry list of what you're storing up there. And you're then making use of the riches. It's not a bank that you're hoping to get standard interest on. It's not an index fund that matches the S&P or the Dow. It is actually the empowerment, the power, the, the real riches that you then use. You don't just set them there. We are granted all spiritual blessings. That word there that is kind of shortened there could also be rendered or prevented, presented to us as all the blessings of the Spirit. And think about it this way. In the old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, God promised his, he, uh, his earthly people, people, Israel, physical blessings in the great promised land. 
It's a land described in visual terms as full of milk and honey. God says to us that you get that because I'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of you. Even knowing your needs, count the hairs in your head, you'll be taken care of better than all of the creation and more. Because he says, not only here in Ephesians, but say in a text of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, he's going to provide to us according to his riches in glory by the anointed Jesus, King Jesus. He gives us not only what we need, but also provides for what we will need hereafter. There is a grand scope in all of this. But in essence, what Paul is saying is to reorder your spiritual life, which then actually reorders your physical life, and says, be rich. That's actually kind of easy to figure out. As a kid, I remember there's a television show. I don't even know if it exists because A, I don't watch cable or have cable television, and B, I don't have the time to watch TV much at all. But there's a show called The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Some of you may actually, like, there's, okay, if you want a new, new version of it, I think it's like Cribs. You've seen, like, MTV Cribs. That's the same thing for younger people. And then the actual younger people, they have something else. It's probably on TikTok somewhere. What you've got there, though, is a window into a world that's not yours. Oh, they live in these great houses, and they go on great vacations, and they have big yachts. And they're basically saying you're not rich. And if you were rich, it'd be like this. What Paul says to those at Ephesus is stop acting like you're poor. Be rich. Now, here's the thing. I mentioned the city of Diana, the whole goddess of Diana context. Ephesus is super wealthy in the first century world. So it's full of gold. It's full of rich people. They lived basically surrounded by the lifestyles of the rich and famous. And so Paul is using the world around them to tell them, hey, be rich. And they can come back, but we don't have anything. You've got everything. Live like you have everything. Reorder your sense of physicality because your sense of spirituality overrides the other. And stop acting like you're impoverished still. He says, what are you talking about? What impoverishes a soul? What makes one man poor? Remember what the statements of Jesus might hint to us towards. You may gain the whole world, but lose the very most precious thing you have. That's your soul. It actually is the most precious thing. And not only do you have it, it's been rebuilt. It's not just a barn find that maybe sputters. It's been perfected. You have those riches. Those riches are within you. Okay, now go out and drive it. Go out and live that way. Because the worst thing to me is finding out someone has a pristine Shelby and it never moves from their garage. Like, why would you even do that? Go sell it to someone who will drive it. Because otherwise it's just a hunk of metal sitting in a, in a garage somewhere that only you get to see. But the purpose to have a Shelby for me would be to drive it. And the purpose for your soul is it for, for it to be engaged in the use of everything that God has granted to you. Paul's letter then as a whole structure is written in the worldview of a people enamored with a great temple of Diana. With all of its beauty and wealth. We have inherited a wealth beyond Every earthly standard. And that ledger sheet, that balance, we need to be spending it. That means it's time to change your behaviors. It's time to change my behaviors. That means it's time for us to live in a way that God is glorified by our lives, our hearts, and our service. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessing that is found in Christ. It is our hope that we use 
the status of our spiritual privilege as a blessing to others. That we pour ourselves out in sacrifice and service. That we are rich in spiritual blessings and so we spend richly. Help our hearts to be tuned for the songs of heaven. Help our lives to be used for the purpose of heavenly goals. And help us to be numbered, counted, and identified as a person who is seeking the kingdom of heaven. This is our prayer in your son's name. Amen.